is it helped us with Kraftwerk to make modern music which fitted to our neighborhood, or to or our surrounding. If we have a nice nature and this wonderful, lovely, romantic rhyme, everything uh, floats into our musical work, you know, it's inspiring. The Trans Europe is an, ex ex an example for me where, where I was in the best time with Kraftwerk because it's absolutely my favorite since all all Kraftwerk albums. And then I leaned over with my with my with my mouth mouth very near to his ear and said, uh, Florian, thank you for all these wonderful 15 years we had together. We love Germans to sing. It's better than Ralf sings. So please do me the favor on the next album. I said, okay, sir. I try, and Peter is also helping me with a little, little bit auto tune, but not much, he says. You are becoming better and better. And on the last track we recorded, he said, we don't need auto tune anymore. Well, Wolfgang Fleur, welcome. I have to say, I've been thrilled and excited to be the receiver of your emails over the, the past few weeks um, and to know how much you are excited about your success of this album, Magazine One, and to be yeah. part of that. And that has, been, that has been something wonderful because I love the fact that someone can, who has been so successful in their life can, can appreciate that sort of success as well. Um, I'm going to come on to, I want to connect that to something in a second, but um, I just want to say that I believe you created a masterpiece and I will probably come to that through the questions that I asked during this interview. But I want to start with this. You're one person who seems to be able to appreciate the moments in life. You appreciate the small things like a landscape, a sandwich. Um, you, ap you appreciate oh. the big things as well. And have you always lived in the moment? And when did you start appreciating the moment? I think so, yes. It is my education. I think um, um, I was always a very vivacious boy, um, uh, given from my mother, I think, and my brothers were too. So I was, I was not, or, or better said, um, I was different to my twin brother. So we are not from one egg, we are different eggs. So he was more uh, the foreseeing uh, guy and he was thinking about everything, resuming and, um, you know, um, he was analyzing everything. So I was more so the forward guy, you know, and I did what I wanted to do. I had always pressure in handicraft and, and thinking and a lot of imaginary in my head. So um, there was no time for thinking over if it is good or bad. I just did all always what I wanted to do in that very moment. So in the moment, uh, you think about it, this moment is already gone and the next is the future. So <laughs> there's no time uh, to think about a lot. And if, if, you, if, you, if you think too long, it's gone. So ideas must be fulfilled in this very moment you have them. And in music and in lyrics writing, this is very important. Well, the idea of, of uh, a magazine a magazine is in essence a moment in time. It's, it's a sort of snapshot of the society at any given moment from the point of view of the people that are involved in the magazine, from the editor's point of view. And if we take that analogy sort of further to obviously your album, Magazine One, uh, then it feels like it is a snapshot of you at a particular time, in essence, almost the present when it was made, um, and it's a snapshot of your views and how you see the world and everything like that. Is that um, how you see it in terms of its concept? Yeah, that's absolutely correct, Steve. So even if we used um, the last five years, but my, in, in my age, five years is a snapshot, you know, and the feelings and the storage which came in my life, in my head, that were very important to me. Um, especially the last song. The crazy thing is when we talked the last time, it was the reason was uh, of war. You remember, um, it was The Little Child, my first song after Kraftwerk, and we had the Bosnian war, you know. That was the first time we met and spoke together. You interviewed me the first time in my life. You were the one to interview me. When was that? On the on the Cologne Fair? On, on the, on the that was, would have been in the late 90s, wouldn't it, I think? Yeah, maybe. 
And now again, um, we have another thing, another war also in Europe. And uh, I have prepared a song for that, but not in the sight of a war, because when we started uh, that song, the last song on the album, we had no war in the Ukraine. So this is, um, there's no coincidence, but uh, it happened. So we speak again about war. Is that not crazy? Well, I think there are, there, okay, there's no coincidence, but I think this is a zeitgeist in a sense that you've yeah. created this track and referring obviously to the Second World War, but maybe you can tell me because it's called Say No and it has a poem by Wolfgang Borchardt um, featured on it, which you, which you wonderfully speak on it or the excerpts of that poem. Can you tell me a little bit about Borchardt and why he and his poetry was important to you? Yes, I love I love Wolfgang Borchardt's poetry since since I can remember since my youth. We had them in my school. My, maybe I was seventeen. Uh, I discovered uh, the lyrics of him with our German teacher. He brought it to us, and the short sentences about war and all his uh, descriptions, what what he um, what he has experienced with war as a soldier, that really hurt my heart and. Uh, and also his, his writing style was much to my um, uh, was much, but, uh, much to my delight. I learned writing from him because I write today my own books and stories and always copied a little bit of him. But um, I make book readings from his books in churches in Germany, in schools, in clubs sometimes. And it's always a big success. The people like how I am reading him. I lent him my voice because we... I, I, I think we are brothers. He was, uh, he died in the same year when I was born. So I, I was born in uh, 1947 in July and he died in the same year in, in October with his first big uh, uh, tale, which was uh, played in a theater in Hamburg then, uh, out, The Outside Man, also out draußen vor der Tür. That was his most famous uh, uh, tale. And many of them were filmed, I think, also. But this track, which we, which I have chosen for my album, I, I always wanted to, to have him um, as a tune and um, in, in in music, you know. And when I uh, worked with Peter and his partner, who sent uh, us that little soundtrack, which inspired me immediately, extremely at once. This is the music. Uh, it was just a little soundtrack, you know, but it hit my heart and said, this is fitting for Wolfgang Borscher Tales. And um, it was perfect for me. I was so, I was, as the English said, flabbergast when I heard it, you know. And, it, and then, and then I, I practiced with my microphone here on the side uh, for two days to get the right, um, um, the right mood to, 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 to think I am Wolfgang, you know. I, I always do when I'm on stage. And I try uh, to bring his voice to the people. I think I'm his brother, you know. And I think we did a good, uh, a good work with this song. I mean, he rebelled against the uh, Nazi dictatorship. He was a young man at the start of the war. I mean, it's yeah. quite fascinating, uh, his story. And he passed around uh, literature when he was in the Bundeswehr, the, the conscripted German army um, yes. during the war. And he was part of a movement called Trummel Literatur, which is rubble literature, if you translate it into English. And you were born into the rubble after the Second World War in Germany, weren't you? Um, what impact does it have on you if you're on an age where you were born so close to a war and you're in the remnants, you're born into the remnants of that war. What effect do you think that has had on your whole life? That was not too much because uh, we were children, little children, and we played in the streets of Frankfurt, which was completely uh, uh, broken, which was down by the Allied troops from the bombs. And um, our house in Frankfurt, Sachsenhausen was not bombed, fortunately. So we lived there with my whole family and my great grandmother, and we had a wonderful life with children. The children, the streets were full of children, 
after the war, the families made children after children because we had so less. Most of the, the young men uh, died in, in the war. So Germany needed new generations, you know. So um, I, I, I cannot believe that we were unhappy then. Uh, we did not know what happened be, uh, before us. So sometimes uh, we found some, some dead uh, soldiers in, in, in the rubbish houses where, where we were all this. Uh, running around in, in the cellar and so on, searching for some things. It was really, really spooky. My child could, we had nothing to play, but in the streets in summer, they were very hot, always absolutely uh, hot. And yeah, we, we didn't need much. So war was not always in, in our brain that, that, that is the result because we did not know anything else. Uh, uh, I mean, a clean city, we did not know that. Uh, at first, later, when I became, um, I was in school and we had uh, some history lessons about war and I was 16, I think my, uh, my, my brain started to, to become interest in, in, the, in, in the past of Germany, why all of these things happened and um, uh, the, with the Jewish and um, everything but what was so nasty then, you know. And then as I started to get more interest in literature about it, I read and I read and my heart broke 20,000 times, you know, and um, I became full of hate against my father's generation. It was very hard. And it led to that, that I, um, that I quit my, uh, my war, uh, my, my, um, my, my um, services, which I had to do. I, the army was calling for me when I was 17 or 18, I think. And it was not so easy then um, to get through that. I had a big law case and um, I had to explain my feelings, why I did not want to take a gun in my hand. I, I swore to the, to the judge, I never would do this. And if you would not allow me to make something different, like a civil service in a hospital, maybe, I was prepared for that already, I would go also into the jail. So don't call me to them. I would never take. I'm not able to this. I'm very sensitive. I'm an artist and uh, forget it. So at least uh, the four, four young men in, on that afternoon, all of them lost. I was the only one who was allowed to, uh, to uh, go to the hospital and have a, 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 yeah, a civil service. How did that hate to your father's generation express itself? Did you confront your father? Did you confront yeah, people of his generation? What did you say? Yeah, I, I said to him, Papa, I don't go to the military. You can do what you want. And he said, yeah, you are too childish. I know, you, you go, go to there and you become a real tough man. I said, I don't need that. I'm an artist, I'm a musician. And my father was not so much in, in, um, yeah, in arts, you know, my mother more. And my, my mother had nothing against that. But my father was really strong and my, my both brothers were, were always taken before me. Um, look, do you always have to do your own thing? Do you do, you do do you have to have your own head? He asked me always. I said, why not? Because I don't want it. So he was very strong and he was very uh, majestic. So um, I was always different to my brothers. They were easy handling, I not. So what, uh, what role did you have? Against my father. My father was my first winning. So I fought it against him. And what role not. then did music play in your early life? Was it a form of escape? Or was it a form of protest? What, what sort of, what role was it for you? Music was always joy to me because, you know, I, I, I'm, I grew up with music. My parents, uh, they're very, um, uh, they lived a party life <laughs> in the weekends. It was my mother. She was very vivacious. She was very beautiful and she loved to dance. And they made uh, often parties in our home because there were no clubs, no discotheques in the 50s, you know. And they invited friends and they made dinner and they danced after that. They made the German bowl, that is wine with fruit, you know. And they got drunken, of course, and uh, it was louder and louder and happier. And I always heard this wonderful uh, melodies of the South American uh, music, which my mother liked from rumba, 
and mamba, zamba, and uh, foxtrot, and this style of music, which is very, very full of melodies. And this, uh, I think this really trained me, and this uh, influenced me in all my life. This is which I still have in me. And this is why I also was happy with Kraftwerk, because they had so romantic melodies in their music compared with technique, to, to record it technically, not with nature instruments, but with um, synthesizers. And uh, which is not really a natural sound, but uh, it it could it could sound natural if you have the right uh, turns, you know, um, knobs and the filters. But anyway, um, the melodies was it, which inspired me most of them. And um, then I noticed that that's that's already in me. And afterwards, when I left Kraftwerk, it was still in me. But I had to invent it. I have to to refine and to invent me completely new after my split with them, because I was only a drummer boy then, as you remember. And uh, to find myself, I had to have, I think, this, this hard um, confrontation with the war in Bosnia then when we met. I had just uh, made my first song and my first lyrics for the children of uh, Sarajevo and this little child track that made me a bit proud and we wanted to make this benefit track for them. And I must say today, at least it helped me more instead of them to find my musicality and my melody making. I mean, another um, connection to Borchardt, just I just finished with a point about him, is that he tore up and threw away his early poems because he was looking at his legacy and saying the early stuff wasn't as good as the later stuff. And I would like to leave my latest stuff so people understand my legacy, which is apparently what he did. In many ways, I feel that this album, although it's not tearing up your early stuff by to any extent, it is almost like a reinvention and incorporation of the early stuff to say, this is more important and this is me, which is why I think this is such a fantastic album. So it's sort of, you know, I just want to draw comparisons between you and Borchardt in terms of what he did and what I feel that you have done. Do you see it in that way or do you see it completely different? No, it's completely as you say. And I mean, I was growing up and I increased my abilities a lot over the years. And also uh, with the help of my friends, I learned a lot from, from my first uh, uh, collaborators or co-producers uh, like uh, Andy Thoma when we produced my first album, uh, Time Pie. He was one of the, the most important um, artists I ever met in my life. And this was so helpful for me. And after that, for the second album with, um, with some other um, musicians I work with, friendly guys, you know, friendliness is always an uh, important thing to me. Otherwise work is not, not uh, possible, but, um, uh, Stefan Lindler, we made a lot of songs for uh, my for my second album, um, Eloquence, and some collaborators, which I work with, you know, all of this helped me to find my way more and more. And as I said, increasing my uh, abilities uh, has also to do with my uh, education, of my, my sight of the world and every experiences I had on the street, on the streets through my life. And also my wife, who is Turkish, we live now since 25 years together. So we have Silber in the Hochzeit this year. I could not believe that we stayed together so long, you know, and I learned so much about her and her culture, even if we have no, not so much uh, Turkish melodies inside, but uh, she likes my music. And she also says, you changed so much since the time party. And uh, it was that year when we came together since uh, 1970. 97. So um, she also sees that. Um, I, I think um, people must have a, a street on, on their artistic life to collect everything what can be uh, valuable for their work, you know. So um, the friends which I collected on my way, they are the most important and the valuable um, thing I, I can ever um, announced today, especially Peter Dugal, who is my uh, partner and my, my musical friend since five years. He is from England. He is, he is Birmingham born. 
and he lives in a small town, Hepton Bridge. And we work uh, from, since five years, we work together on this album. Not all tracks on this are with him, because meanwhile, I had also started with uh, Hayu Leverance from U96 and his partner Ingo. And we already had uh, made some collaborations for their album. And um, I took some of their tracks and changed them completely to different themes with my lyrics and my melodies inside. So they were pretty astonished what I made with their soundtracks, you know, at least they come from the techno music, you know, and they never made pop music, never made so much with lyrics and uh, strophes and verses and, and choruses. So th this, this is, a, this is um, something what I learned very good. I, I, I know very well what a pop song has to transport, what has to be inside to have a, um, 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 to, to tell a good story inside. So, I mean, you must be a, a, a storyteller in the first sight. You must have a theme, something to tell to the people. If you sing or if you speak, no matter. But if you don't have anything to sell, you, you are a musician and make soundtracks. This is how I met Peter. Peter's soundtracks really uh, touched me. I heard them on SoundCloud. He recommended me uh, some, some uh, codes. I loaded them down. I said, wow, this is something really good. This is film music to me. I have very good ideas when I hear something. I'm inspired. And then my imagination is spreading and, and glimmering and, you know, and suddenly I have an idea, a theme to it. And that first uh, was the first um, we worked on Birmingham, a city in England, the second, uh, you, you know, Birmingham. I mean, I fell in love with Birmingham, not only because it's the hometown and the birth town of Peter, his huge family is living there. I was invited so often to this wonderful and friendly people. And I played pretty often in clubs, my Music Soldat live show there and always had good experiences. So uh, when I heard the soundtrack, which was already uh, named uh, from Peter Birmingham, I said, let's make a pop song from it. Oh, would, would you mind? I said, yes, of course, it's important, you know, it's your city. And by the way, uh, I shortly found out that my birth town, Frankfurt, and his birth town, Birmingham, are partner cities since many years. So why not doing songs about our birth cities, which anyway are partners now? Incre incredible, huh? But also that Dusseldorf is considered, you know, sort of a yes. glass city and Birmingham is a glass city. Did you understand Birmingham in that way when you were there? Because also right, Dusseldorf, yeah. I don't know whether it's the fifth or sixth largest city in, in, in Germany. And Birmingham is always considered, you know, the second or third city in, in Britain. Yeah. So it has some sort of connection in that way yeah even if if Düsseldorf has a bit more glass and more steel and more aluminium because it was nearly totally broken down as Frankfurt so we had to um to rebuild it and um made it a bit a bit more modern than Birmingham but I love cities which are half and half you know I would love to have some more old houses in Düsseldorf uh, from, from the last century or so um I, unfortunately we don't have uh, at any case, it helped us with Kraftwerk to make modern music which fitted to our neighborhood, uh, to uh, our surrounding. It, everything what artists do describe their surrounding where we grow up. That, that's for sure. And if we have a nice nature and this wonderful, lovely, romantic rhyme, everything uh, floats into our musical work, you know. It's inspiring. I mean, before we get onto the track, Birmingham, I just want to talk about the artwork, which is obviously behind you and uh, of course this is a podcast I, I i will show some of this on uh, on yeah. social media but because this is a podcast people can't see it instantly but it's also a combination between the old uh and the new and it's the rebirth it's it's got lots of sort of you know meanings within that and it was uh created by a friend of yours marcus luix marcus luix yes marcus luix is a long time friend from me He's a photographer and um, a an, um, graphic artist. And um, I learned him, um, I met him the first time also in the same uh, year when I met my wife. We, she was my girlfriend then and she introduced me to him. And she said, he's just in the end of his studies and he must move, uh, make a book or anything 
for his last work for his professor. And then I had already written my book about my uh, time with Kraftwerk. I was a robot with this title. And I asked uh, Markus if he can make the layout for the book uh, for the publisher. And he got a little money from them. And uh, that was his first work. And I was really very, very happy. Since then, I know him. And I also uh, can uh, experience and uh, see how he uh, developed with everything he does with photos. He makes big, big exhibitions in Dusseldorf, meanwhile. And he, he writes books about Dusseldorf and other books. And he made, since then, he made every artwork which, which I needed in books and albums in sleeves. And um, this, this, uh, this cover from Magazine One, which uh, I have bought on, on, a, uh, on, an, on an exhibition. It's behind me, one meter to one meter in this size, uh, made me immediately accept this is very good fitting to my album, which was, uh, the working title was Collaborators then. And I saw these two buildings as completely different characters, as collaborators trying to do something new, the old and new, and which always happened. Um, Let's go back in uh, 1997, uh, when I was with uh, Andy Thoma, he was young, I was old. Uh, so I was the brick, uh, the, the, the broken house, and he was the new house. He was the steel guy. He was modern and so. But we did something new together, which it fitted. And he said, we learned so much from you, Wolfgang, because we never go prepared into a recording session. We, we, we play daily mood. We go on our synthesizer and we play daily mood, you know? And afterwards we think, Oh, what, what, what can we call it? Um, orange thing or so. Yeah. And I said, I come always completely prepared with a theme, with lyrics and melodies in my head. And I explain my collaborators uh, what should happen inside. And so we start pretty good compared. It's, it's easier then to come to results, you know. Yeah, with this, with this, uh, uh, with this picture which I bought from him, he, uh, he gave me uh, the permission that I can use it on my album. That made him proud, of course. And um, then we we had a, um, a celebration. I think it was in a restaurant. We sat all together with my friends and we spoke about that new album with all these different themes inside. And I said. Uh, he asked me, he did not hear any one of them. We were in the draft uh, period. And I said, I can yet send you some drafts tomorrow. And when he heard them, he said, yeah, Wolfgang, you, what you spoke yesterday, that you have so many different themes. And he said, you, you leave like, like, like a paper mag or so. Then call it magazine. My God, it is a magazine. It's an audio magazine, not collaboration. Shit, forget that. It's magazine, you know. And it, you can leave through it. And every page has another theme, like, in a, like People's Magazine or any other thing, you know. And he said, wonderful. Why did you not say that before? <laughs> so that the, th the theme was born, you know, and now we have magazine one and magazine two is already prepared for next year. Mean meanwhile, I think nearly 80% finished. Now, exactly. you said, you said, you know, it could have been called collaborators. It could have been called collaborators and lots of guests <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because there are immense yeah, amount of, of guests. If we look at yeah. Birmingham, you've got uh, uh, Peter Hook, who's yeah. uh, from Manchester. I mean, you know, <laughs> Joy Division and New Order. It's a wonder that it's a it's a wonder that we want him because the crazy thing is Andy McClasky did not want to sing the song because he's from Liverpool and he did not want to sing to sing a song about Birmingham. So he was against it. So I'm friendly with him, but Claudia did it very well, you know. Oh, Claudia is just wonderful. But I just want to say this: Birmingham, uh, Liverpool, Manchester triangle. It's a little bit like Dusseldorf and Cologne. So there Correct. we have another connection going on. Um, yeah. Claudia Brooken, of course, was in uh, uh, Propaganda, and um, she recorded this in the studio. Um, was that that was in OMD studio in Liverpool, wasn't it? Uh, is it in Liverpool? I thought it's London. Is it in London? With Paul Humphreys. <laughs> Yeah. From OMD. Ah, okay, that's in London. Yeah. Did so, you... why? How did that come about? Was it was she someone you approached, or was that someone that Peter approached? No, Peter didn't know her about that. Um, did not know all too much about propaganda, and um, she was my second um, idea. My first idea was uh, like on the on, on on the last album. Um, 
Miriam Suarez, um, she sang, she's from Essen, it's a city near Düsseldorf in the Ruhrgebiet. And uh, she's half Spanish and half German. She has a wonderful voice. And she sang on my last album, uh, different songs. And I w always wanted to have her to have a complete uh, track to sing. Now she is the back singer in many of our songs, like also in, um, in Say No and others. But uh, I could not reach her in that time. She's sometimes difficult to reach. I don't know why, but she's a wonderful and beautiful young girl, a young woman meanwhile. And um, anyway, I did not reach her then. I tried and tried and then I thought who could sing the song. And suddenly, I don't know why, I came on the idea to ask Claudia, which I know since long. And I had met her the last time in Dusseldorf, I think it's four years ago, when this uh, Kraftwerk concert was in, 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 in the open air region, in, in, the, in the museum area, you know. And we had a big party afterwards without Kraftwerk and many artists were there in, 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 in the restaurant, in the brewery restaurant on Oststraße also with, um, um, with, uh, with uh, um, ah, the drummer of Duff, tell me the name. Oh, that girl. Oh, that girl was also there. So, so many artists were there and um, publishers uh, from, from the record guys and A&Rs, oh, so many people. And Claudia was sitting between them with her girlfriend. Uh, Susanne, and then suddenly uh, we spoke a little bit after the uh, after the after the dinner in, in in a bar. We all went and had some drinks, and uh, I took her uh, aside. Would would you not do something with me once in the future? It was not already Birmingham, but just a talk. She said, "Of course, any time. Ask me then." And that came up, and then I asked her, I sent her an email, and she said immediately, "Yes, yeah, send me the melody, send me the lyrics. Why not?" Yeah, we sent her the back the background music, and I sang uh, the songs with my oh, not so good singing. It was pretty bad, but that she at least I was not a good singer, and I'm I'm still not a good singer. But anyway, for this track, we needed a good singer, not not with this, this speech singing style which I present in the other tracks, but. Um, yeah, she, she said, it's lovely, it's lovely. Oh, I, it's really lovely. I love to do it. And she uh, give, gave something from her own melody in the back, in the end of her, and uh, of, of the melodies. And it was wonderful. When it came back, she said, my, um, I demand to sing it here, not in, you, in, in your studio in Dusseldorf. Because I invited her to my home, where I always record myself, and I can do pretty well here. But she said, okay, I agree to everything. What's, what's your um, idea? She said, uh, Paul Humphreys, please. And um, yeah, I said, go ahead. And she did it there. She feels well with him. She was, I think, married with him. So they know each other very, very well. And it's good if you have a good, um, a good connection to the technician or to the musician who's working with you. She does not know me musically so much. So maybe she was a bit shy or I don't know. Um, it was fine, at least. I mean, you say that you're you're not a singer in inverted commas, but you, in a, in you developed your voice um, mm -hmm. over the years, and you hear that on this on on this album. How has that come about? Because that must have been, you know, some form of process over the years yeah. to do that. So how have you achieved that? Uh, my label partner from Sherry Red Records, which is Barnaby Ashton Bullock, uh, he's friendly with me. Meanwhile, we are good friends since uh, the Eloquence album. He said, Wolfgang, there are some spots on the Eloquence album, which I still like very much. And it's a start for you. I hear that. Do me a favor, sing more, please, sir, sing sing, sing. We love to hear your voice, even if it's not the brilliant uh, orchestra thing, but we love Germans to sing. It's better than Ralph sings. So please do me the favor on the next album. I said, okay, sir, I try. And I took some lessons as well, I, I promise. And um, I had some good uh, technique and Peter is also helping me with a little, little bit auto-tune, but not much, he says, you are becoming better and better. And on the last track we recorded, he said, we don't need auto-tune anymore. So uh, 
But sometimes we do uh, um, uh, we, we do an octave deeper or an octave higher on my voice. You know the same uh, voice we can record, and that has to to refresh it a little bit. So there are some tricks inside that at least um, people can 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 relish it a bit. I mean, it is a sort of reinvention of you as well, because I presume you sang in your early bands. You were yes. also singing. Um, um, <laughs> and this time, you know, on tracks like Electric Sheep that you hear um, your voice coming through um, and this reinvention. And I sort of I can really understand that because when I lost my job, which was effectively losing my career back at my Viva time in the mid 90s, I went through the wilderness for about 10 years. Your wilderness was also quite a long um, period, wasn't it? How important was that period to your development? Because when I look back at that period, I see it as the actual fundament of what I can do today. And it changed me massively. So how do you see that 10 years? Yeah, these 10 years were uh, absolutely uh, important to me. I could have done like Carl, my other very, very nice colleague from Kraftwerk. He left Kraftwerk a year after me, and he was um, making also his own music with um, electric music. That was his band's name. And um, he did many songs in the Kraftwerk style because he thought he must uh, do absolutely Kraftwerk music because he thought that they don't do them. So I have to do. And he wanted to, to do the better Kraftwerk songs than anyone else, you know. And to um, kannst ruhig reinkommen. Ich habe dich gesprochen. My <laughs> wife wants to see you. Oh, lovely. <laughs> oh, hi. hi. Nice to meet you. <laughs> I, I, spoke with, I spoke with her about I, you and that you were my first interviewer. Uh, I, All right. I, don't, I don't know uh, who is he. Yeah. Who are you? Who I am. I, uh, yeah, you know In me. In my life. <laughs> yeah. Your wife doesn't know he's, you, yeah. He's funny. He's always kidding and funny, making jokes on Sometimes me. Sometimes the fans... Uh, want uh, from me uh, on gigs come to backstage with me i say i don't know who is it i'm here <laughs> from stuff i don't know <laughs> I <agree. laughs> that's the best that's the best way to kidding. treat them <laughs> she's kidding. She, she films all my shows with a big camera you know she is a very good filmer so she <laughs> travels with me on my shows and films yeah Oh, fantastic. That's fantastic. Well, it's <laughs> lovely to see you. <laughs> no, that's really great. Um, no, going back to, let's go back to electric sheep. Yeah, because these 10 we, years, yeah. yeah. These 10 years were very important to me because um, I, I saw me not able to make music then because I was not, I did not feel like a, a musician who produces music. I was a drummer then, as you remember. And to find my musicality, I needed a long, long distance from Kraftwerk. So what did I have to do? I must, uh, I had to do, I had to uh, earn money for my rent, you know, and for my eat. And so I made furniture design in these 10 years. So uh, everything what I learned before was helping me. So um, um, when, when I was studying interior design and I have my apprenticeship as a carpet maker and anything, was helping for me. And I was, again, happy with that. With two other guys, we made the GAF, GRF studio, and we had very, very good offers for furniture design for rich Dusseldorf people. We have a lot of rich uh, living in, in our town, in our city, from uh, lawyers, from doctors, and from photographers. And uh, we made very, very elegant uh, Bauhaus style furniture for them. So I thought, this is my future now. I did not think on music. Maybe this was good that I came far away from music, you know. But sometimes Florian stepped in. He was the only one to visit me sometimes because he liked me much and I him. So it was always a bit making me sad, thinking about the old times. And he was always promising, Wolfgang, we will make a new tour. We will record new, new music. I promise you, then you come back. It did not happen, but um, I, I also said to him, I think, I think I would not do it again. And I'm finished with this, you know, because they anyway did not need a drama anymore. And just uh, to push some little knobs on, 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 a, on, on a switchboard for programmed music, sequenced drums, uh, that was not my style to go with them on stage. I need drums, you know, the electric drums. 
anyway, um, these 10 years until 1993, when I started with this uh, new song, um, was very important to me that I kept away from, the, from, the, from this virus Kraftwerk in me to get it out. Like I had taken an antibiotic to get this virus out, you know, it needed time uh, to get, uh, to get new, new, new healing from an illness, which was in the end, I felt ill because it, everything ended so bad for me, you know, and also for them, the feeling between us four was really no more good, long time. After 81, which is, was the peak of Kraftwerk from my view with the computer world, everything was rubbish. So the last album was done, not really by heart. It was called Coffee and everything else was called Coffee because the others were only with their bicycles. They had new interests, new gears, new machines and new uh, interests of techniques and so, but, but that was not my thing and also not Carl's. So, um, I was visiting Karl in, in this time pretty often in his own studio at Stockholm Strasse. And um, when he produced with Lothar Manteuffel his first tracks on, uh, but I always spoke with him. I said, it's, it's like you were in Kraftwerk, you know? And he said, yeah, yeah, I, I, want, I want to continue that because they don't do. And maybe, maybe the, I, I would not rate this, but maybe that was not, not the right idea because as long as Kraftwerk are still alive and bringing their shows, there must not be someone else to bring Kraftwerk music, even if he was very important to them. And I must repeat again and again how important Karl was in the last album since um, The Man Machine, I think, his writing his writing sessions, which he de describes in his own books, were so important to them that without him, there were only less albums, maybe the half of them. So good, because Karl was so involved, you know. I mean, you say that uh, in that period, one thing that really was paramount was not to repeat craft work, but there are nods to craft work in in your work, obviously. So you're not sort of denying that part of, of your life. And if you look at Night Drive, you <laughs> I this. have read that. I have he read that. Absolutely the same. And I, he starts with that already. You cannot get Kraftwerk out of his head. I was a, I was a bit, I was a bit um, against that. But if they start with that, you know, I can remember with my first album, Time Park, there was a Tim Barr. He was the editor of Future Music then in 1979, 1997. He came to Dusseldorf Extra and made a two day uh, interview with me. And his article in, in the sound, uh, in, in the future uh, music, started with this word. And does it sound like Kraftwerk? So this is always wanted, always the journalists ask me how that they get a little spread of something, give me a little craft back, you know? And um, I cannot say that I planned this in my music, uh, which is in my, in my uh, personality, in, in, in my veins is the melodies. And that was, as we already described already before, from my mother's side, you know, this musicality. But I had to invent that. I had to see that first um, after Kraftwerk. It's crazy. So, so tell me about Night Drive then, the track on the album. Yeah, that was a very um, difficult thing to, to go into this. Uh, it was also a little soundtrack in, with maps as a, as a, as a music program, a music, um, it's a, it's a music uh, project from, from a friend of Peter. And Max Wheeler is the guy, and he made a big interview with us in London when we played. Peter is always playing as a support to me on my shows. And we had, a, I think it was, um, I was it, where was it, under the bridge or in another club? Oh, nee, we, we made, I think, uh, yeah, we played the Club 100, this old-fashioned uh, old club. And, um, in our hotel uh, um, restaurant on the next morning after the breakfast, Max Wheeler, he made a long uh, interview with us. It's already on YouTube also. And Peter said, he's a very good musician and he wanted to do something with you, if you would not mind. He said, send us something. 
and a little soundtrack, but he said, did not really touch me in the first moment. Um, I laid it beside, aside and we had uh, work on different things. A year later, maybe it came up and he always asked me, um, would you mind to take it again? And do you have an idea? And then I had a little idea of, of one melody inside. It's a bit spooky because I mean, this, this theme, um, his theme was um, 4 a.m. With 4 a.m. I have nothing to do. Normally, normally I sleep then. And, but there is a nice little story from, uh, from the singer inside. She's talking about uh, night drive. And I thought, okay, we, may, we, we call it night drive. And I tell my own story about night drives or not night drives, but everyone is talking about any drive of a band, of an artist to a place where they play. And I could uh, say, okay, then I tell something from my former band when we played the, in Paris the first time with, and we drove with a train to there with a TEE. -E. And the Trans Europe is an, ex, it's an example for me where, where I was in the best time with Kraftwerk because it's absolutely my favorite since all, all Kraftwerk albums. And I think I, I must remind the people a little bit of that. And um, then I spoke and I, I wrote my lyrics about this drive to Paris. And um, yeah, it grew, but it, it took time. It took time and it changed different. It was a very, very uh, long time to work on that. It was difficult to get it into a shape like it is today. We put it aside so often and took it on. And then we had this very complicated uh, soundtrack inside. I thought, Peter, we must have something because it's it's became longer and longer and longer. And it's it's like a, a road movie, like uh, Autobahn maybe. So we have to have a, a soundtrack inside with the train uh, running over the tracks, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, something which, which is hard, which is comes from steel, from the sounds outside with a juju -ju -ju and anything. And he said, okay, I go with that, give, give me a week. And he produced this pretty alone without me. I only give my words afterwards inside. And I said, wow, that's the so, the, the so called third level. I love third levels in tracks to go ahead in a completely different level and then later come back to the music into a chorus or to speak, to continue the story, you know? And this is a trick of me, Peter says, this is, this is something you really can do very well. We need always a third level in a song and, and that it, the, 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 the string dance is not so boring, you know? just to repeating always the first and the chorus and the first and the chorus and maybe we high in, uh, high in, in, in the end of some notes and okay this is the usual thing people do but some can really produce very good third levels which is um, yeah throwing you away into the atmosphere and when you are landing back <laughs> you must try to get into the song again this is um, something, that's a very good description how we work together. Sometimes the tracks need very long time until they have the shape and no idea from the start how it ends. Everything happens by chance or given from above, you know? So we had so much signs from above to our music, sometimes it was really crazy. And Peter had some ideas, the same ideas, some, we are like brothers. Peter says something, I said, uh, exactly that I wanted I just I wanted to tell to you. So we had millions of emails there and back and telephones, Zoom calls, and we sent so many files, musically files, uh, big files there and back. Thanks God that we have this strong internet today. Otherwise we could not have worked, especially not on the Corona time where we could not visit each other. I mean, that track has these different perspectives going on, which you sort of mentioned in these different layers. And, and coming back. And you mentioned that Peter is like a brother, but brothers disagree and brothers fight. And in a creative atmosphere, that can be important. So oh, how yeah, do you we, deal we with that? Fight. We did fight often, yeah, of course. We were loud sometimes. But that's the good thing. Uh, we always were fine afterwards, but uh, um, at least uh, it, it works fine. He was one, uh, he was a person I did not know before. And in 2015, I had an invitation to Hepton Bridge Arts Festival. It's a small town. It's one of the loveliest English towns ever I saw. And uh, the, they have that famous club, the, the Straits Club. Many bands play there. 
a week before us, um, Heaven 17 played there. So you won't believe that this club is full, filled, it's filled, it's stuffed in the evening. When you come there in the afternoon, nobody is in the town. It's so small, you know, but the people know it in all the cities around, they come to the famous concerts. And in that very hot June, where we were invited to the arts festival, Peter was the one uh, to invite me via email. And he picked us up at uh, uh, Leeds Bradford Airport and uh, brought us with his private car to the White Lion Hotel. That's the only one they have there in Hepton Bridge. And in that one hour drive, we became brothers already. It's sometimes very, very, uh, it needs very short when the, the physicals are different, but the, 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 the heart and the head is alike. So we were joking from the very first moment. And when you look on the backside of my album, there is a photo from him and me. We are just coming out of the hotel where we put our luggage in and we take us in, on the shoulders and we are laughing at each other. And we look like we, they know since years. And it was just one hour. You said that all musicians are actors. What do you mean by that? By what? That all musicians are actors. Yeah, that's correct. Um, I see that. Maybe others not, but I see that everyone, uh, when he goes, when a musician goes on the stage, he plays a role. That is, it has to do if he is a singer or he's any doing something else on the stage, plays a song, he is that song. And he's completely different, I think, when he goes back to the backstage or he gets home into his kitchen and cooks a meal, as I do, I love to cook, then I'm completely different. And as I am on the stage, when I am on the stage today, I am music so loud. That's a very hard and strong thing to produce music. And it goes to all my veins and muscles. I'm moving and moving and music, I, I play, I play the music, I, I move my music. It's not just I put some knobs like DJs doing. I am the music. So and in Kraftwerk, I was not allowed. I was just, okay, that, that thing on stage, that was the only live thing. When we came to the, to the edge of the stage and we danced a little bit, you know, it was the thing what the people loved most. Today, they don't move anymore. There are statues, you know, and that would not be my thing, by the way, but, um, Artists that go on stage, they know they present something and the people want something to them. I know, for example, um, your, um, 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 the frontman of um, the groups, Jürgen Engler. Uh, I know when he's on the stage with his leather clothes and he's dressed as a strong steel man and he hammers um, with his uh, steel uh, symphony on, on and he's, a, he's, he seems a hard staff guy with all the others. It's so rock music, you know. And if you find him privately in the backstage, he's a very smart boy. He's, 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 like, he's like mama boy a little bit, you know. He drinks milk, he does not drink alcohol, he had, has, had never had a cigarette. He's, others would say, he's not a real man, but he is, you know. But he's different, you know. But very, very uh, he's so wonderful, smart, a smart boy, you know. But on the on the stage, he's completely other. It's his role. That it's is also it's also a defense mechanism, isn't it? It's also a way of keeping part of yourself private. Yeah. yeah. Is Absolutely. that important to you as well to keep part yeah. of yourself private? Yes, of course. Absolutely. Well, what does that mean? <laughs> Sorry to pry. <laughs> you mean um what, well, what why I is do? privacy important? Why is that? Why is holding something back important? Ach, my, I could, I, I can move myself. I can do what I want, especially in Dusseldorf. I can go to the market. I'm, I'm not famous anyway. I, I don't feel famous. Also in Kraftwerk, I never feel what is fame. What feeling is this? You know, um, it's different when I'm in in England or in other countries. I'm acknowledged much more. I must much more often give signatures or so. That has to do uh, with England and their culture of uh, and, and their understanding of their musicians. They love their musicians much more than Germans. I think you know what I mean. And um, it is very good. On the other hand, when I live in Dusseldorf and I go shopping because I am the cook at home and I love that and I go to the market or to the shops, nobody knows me. I'm an average man. And I love this being an average man. Nobody disturbs me, you know. And um, 
it is different when I'm in England and especially in, in my shows, so many fans are waiting before the show are already outside with millions and tons of LBs, uh, albums and CDs and, and uh, posters to, to, to have them signed or afterwards at the merch table, the row becomes longer and longer. And sometimes the, the time I have to be there and sign the things is longer than my show. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's all, that's my role, you know? And I'm happy to be then later on with my friends in the hotel back after party in the bar. I mean, this album, you've worked with so many other people on this album. Uh, Raymond Amesqua, uh, Mitch Ewer, Juan Atkins, uh, U96, you mentioned, Claudia Brooken mentioned, yeah. Peter Hook. I mean, there's a, a plethora, you know, of, of, of artists who are great names, very talented uh, in their own fields and all connected to you. Um, through this album, how fulfilling is it for you to know that all these artists are so easily prepared uh, to be part of your project or your and Peter's project, I should say? I must honestly say this was not the plan, so, but it happened. And that's what you say, I do not plan anything. It comes, it comes in that moment and I don't think and I don't uh, uh, overthink that. If, if that is a good chance or so. I mean, um, the best um, description I can give with Mitch Uhr. So I was invited from a Düsseldorf friend to a concert of Mitch Uhr, of former Ultra Fox, at the Savoy Theatre. And I was very uh, astonished how many hits they played. So with, with his band, uh, Electronica, which are not an electronic band, by the way, but uh, it, the concert was brilliant. And we were invited by his uh, tour manager um, to the after uh, to the to the backstage afterwards, and we were immediately in a very good talk. So he's so down to earth. He's so friendly, and it was such a lovely talk. And um, yeah, I mean, we we said goodbye after an hour or so, and, and he said, "I'm in Düsseldorf again in the end of the year, Wolfgang. Would would we meet again? I invite you to the Stahlberg." as the steel company and we were the, of course did i go there because also the tiny magnetic pads they played there uh, the support and i had already done with them a collaboration song for their album and so we know, knew each other and it might be um, could have been a nice party to see all of them back and it was the after party was two hours in their room and uh, so many people and uh, personal friends from him from Belgium were there and uh, tiny magnetic pets and my friend Carsten Sievert was in. And then uh, Mitch Orr came alongside to me and we, we went into a corner of that big room and had a glass of champagne and he said, Wolfgang, should we not do something together? And I said, that exactly I wanted to ask you, you were the first. And he said, I have already an idea, but I wouldn't tell now. I said, why not? Yeah, I, I, I must work a little bit fun, give me some time. Okay, okay, okay. Wonderful, because I'm just in, in, in the recording of my new album, which shall be called Collaborators, and then you would be one of them. I said, it would be an honor to work with you. And I said, okay. And uh, it took some weeks, I think, or a month at least, uh, to have a draft from him on my computer. And I said, wow, what is this? It was called Das Beat. At a speed, my first thought as, um, was, it must it, it must be the der beat. In German, we have this article, der die das. And but I thought the speed, maybe if it's wrong, he it tells it so nicely. It it sounds so charming, so so English wrong, but so good in German. Das beat, and I asked why das beat, and he said, yeah, it's in reminiscence to you, Wolfgang. You are the electric drummer, Wolfgang. We English uh, artists, we musicians. When we think on electronic drum, we, we think on you, it's you. That's reminiscent. So I write, wrote some lyrics and maybe you write anything else or go ahead with what I have done. So it was a wonderful melody and it was a special um, music behind him, pr pretty English, pr pretty British. And um, it was okay to me, but it was not electrifying me enough. I said it to Peter, I said, we must electrify it more in our style. And our idea, so my idea and uh, Mitch Gour's idea was that we do two versions. That was 
from the start we had uh, um, agreed to that. Everyone does his own version for his album because he is also working on a new album. And um, I think it's already out, I'm not sure. So we started to electrify it and I wrote my lyrics and uh, sang it in my style, my, my way of the speech, what rhythm and uh, the, the, the daily structure has to be with us. The speech is always uh, organizing us and always dictating us. So it dictates our daily structure. That was the start of my idea. And so we make that duo singing. See, he sings, I sing, and I added some killer melodies on that. I call them killer melodies because they won't go out of your ears, you know. So um, uh, that's a talent I had to uh, uh, detect in myself. I did not know that before, that I have this talent for such melodies, which are in the tracks and also in the speed. So that came, everything came wonderful together. And that was a track. We needed the shortest time to get it finished. Two or three days, it was done. With the album, there's also a, a magazine, which in this magazine is, you know, obviously all the explanation and the background of the, of the tracks and the people that you work with. And you mentioned Florian earlier and how you would met him um, a few times in the past, but there was obviously a, a, a period where you hadn't seen him and then you bumped into him, um, I believe it was in Dusseldorf. Um, yeah. How important was that meeting and could you explain that meeting to me? Are you especially speaking about his last meeting with him? Your last meeting with Florian, you... Yeah, with... that was in 2016, I think. So, or 17, I think 16, I think. Uh, he was suddenly in a restaurant on the Schumacher restaurant. This is a brewery, a very famous one on uh, Oststraße. And um, it was also a restaurant we used in, with Kraftwerk very often because our studio was uh, walkway uh, distance. And we had in the afternoon or in the evening, we had very often there uh, our meals and had an alt beer. And so very, very famous, very delicious. So um, I still love that. And sometimes I celebrate my, my birthday parties. It was one of them that, that dates. And it was not my birthday, but another friend of mine had a birthday. And we sat with six people on a table. And uh, some of my friends uh, kicked up on my shoe under the, under the table and said, in your back, maybe, I think it's Florian sitting behind you, the next table with two ladies a black lady and a white lady, young, beautiful girls. Maybe it's him. And I thought to myself, I haven't seen him so long now. What, how should I react? And I did not know. And I thought, I look a little bit up this, the ceiling, and this wonderful architecture and the paintings to have a chance to have a little bit of my twinkle to see what's happening behind me. And it was Florian. I, I knew now it is him, exactly. And I did not know at the first moment how to react after so many years. And we had a little uh, quarrel about my book, but, but we, what I wrote and they didn't want to write me that you remember about this, this stupid thing we had. But now we were older and I had forgiven everything. And um, I mean, it, 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 was, it was childish what, what they did and they didn't want to, uh, to write me a book about my life and my feelings. Anyway, everything was in the air and I wanted to have a, a, good, a good feeling now, a good, uh, a good level, a good statement. I did not know how to do. I drink another beer and, and, and a, little, uh, a little corn we had, you know. This is schnapps, little of schnapps. And <laughs> but it, we were in a, in, already in a funny uh, level. And suddenly I had, I felt, a hand on my shoulder and I looked up and said, Florian, I, I did very astonished. I, I can't believe that. Even if I knew that he was sitting behind, it was him to come to me. And I found that very, very nice. I stood up immediately and we were standing very close at each other, smiling. And I felt suddenly to take him in my arms, to embrace him. We never did that before when we were young. So we had to be old and wise men to do this. And he, 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 he liked it. I, I, could, I could feel that he liked it, but he was, I felt he was very thin, a little bit 
shivering. So he was not stable standing. I felt something is wrong with him. I did not see him so slender, you know. But it was anyway, it was nice. And then I leaned over with my with my with my mouth mouth very near to his ear and said, uh, Florian, thank you for all these wonderful 15 years we had together. And he said, Correct, Wolfgang, these were the best years. And then I said, I'm in a new album. And I said, Thank you for your wonderful song you did. I have heard it against the pollution in the ocean plastic, so uh, against plastic, so save the fish. I'm so happy that you're still making music and it's such a lovely song. I'm also doing new music. And he said, Wolfgang, this is also good that you make music. And I said, would you mind to make a collaboration? He said, we will do, we will do. So that was the last what we sat together. And then we invited him with his both ladies to sit at our table and to celebrate with us, but they denied, they, they said no time. So it's your thing, but it's nice that you met you and we spoke some words together. That was very absolute important to me after all these years that uh, at least with him, I had a nice conversation. I did not know that his dad was so near. That was really a shock to me. I mean, I found that that um, story. It's very beautiful. It's very sad, but it, it, there's also a positivity to it because the relationships we have in our life sometimes don't close or end in in a positive way. And right. here, there is some form of small positive end yeah. to to the relationship before he died, which yeah. I think was really lovely. Um, as I started uh, this interview, and I mentioned that I really believe this is a masterpiece, which I do, and I want to go back to what Borchardt uh, did with his art, as it were, and he, in a sense, got rid of the past to show the body of work that he wanted to be out there and to say, this is me, this is what I can really do, and this is my work. And that's what I felt really strongly from listening to this album, that this is the Wolfgang Fleur album from beginning to end. And it is that development that you've had over the years. And I'm not wiping away the past to any extent because all past is important, but this is the present and the current, and this is your masterpiece. And I really wanted to congratulate you for that. Thank you very much, sir. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>